In 1983, when I moved from Vail, Oregon, which is a town of about 1,500 people on the eastern border of Oregon State, up to Seattle to attend college, a whole new world of experiences was open to me. I'd grown, I'd grown up in eastern Oregon, and I grew up farming and hunting and fishing and playing outdoors and riding dirt bikes. I was a ranch hand for a little while on a ranch just down from Bully Creek Reservoir, and, and I would literally be a part of taking the cattle in the spring up to Cottonwood Mountain and then checking on them over the summer and then bringing them back um, at the end of the summer. I worked for a couple of years as a wildfire firefighter uh, on rangeland for the Bureau of Land Management. It was a great adventure. And you know, when I look back on all the adventure that I had as a kid growing up, I, I love the experience that I had. But when I moved to Seattle, very different experiences were suddenly open to me and I, I really embraced those experiences as well. I worked in the restaurant business for a little while, primarily for uh, a restaurant in Edmonds called Williams Restaurant. And it was, uh, it was a great little place and it was run by a guy named William Keegan. He was an older guy, but a delightful older fellow. And he taught me a lot about cooking and about catering. He was one of those guys who didn't think the customer was always right. And I remember one day hearing him say to someone who was complaining about the soup, hey, the soup is supposed to taste that way. If you don't like it, you should definitely go somewhere else and eat. He just didn't have any patience for that sort of stuff. I worked at some flower shops and my favorite was also in Edmonds. It was Bell's Flowers and it was run by Morris Bell, who was probably in his 70s at the time. And he was quite well known for his work. He did amazing work. And I actually got to learn a little bit about flower arranging. And uh, I remember also Morris was one of those guys who didn't think the customer was always right. I, I, heard him talk, I overheard him talking with a couple who came in to talk about a wedding package uh, for their wedding. And he said, that's, that's, not gonna, that's gonna look awful. I'm not gonna do that. Here's what I think you should do. And so I don't remember whether they had him do the flowers or not, but he was kind of like, you can do them or you can not do them, but I'm not doing what you're asking me to do. He was a, he was a great guy to work for. And I really, I really enjoyed the time that I had there. But one of the most ex interesting experiences that I had was a year that I spent in a ballet troupe. I know, I know a guy my size probably shouldn't be in ballet, but there was a couple who would come in routinely to eat at, at, at Williams restaurant. And they were, they were the, they directed the ballet troupe in Edmonds, Washington. And they said, we think it would be great if you joined the troupe. And so I did. And it was really in some ways, a lot of fun. It was just such a different experience for me. But when winter came and I was in the ballet troupe, they approached me and they said, hey, we always put on the Nutcracker and we would love for you to be a part of that, to, to, to dance in the Nutcracker. And, and, and so they asked me to do that. Now, obviously I wasn't gonna get one of the important parts, like, you know, probably wasn't gonna be Uncle Drosselmeyer or Fritz or the Nutcracker. It certainly probably wouldn't be the Sugar Plum Fairy, but, but there was an opportunity and I, I, I wanted to do it, but as it turned out, I was also playing basketball for my college and we had a, a winter tournament. So much to everyone's uh, sadness, I'm sure I wasn't able to do it. But I was thinking back on that moment as I was preparing for this message and, and remembering that in every play, there are multiple characters. Some are prominent characters and some are less prominent characters. But what matters in every play is that everyone understands the role that they play and they understand how they play into the major part of the story. That they remember who the key character is and they do their part in pointing to that character. You know, as we continue on our, in, along in our series of Advent uh, of Our God Who Comes Near, we come to the story of John and Jesus baptizing in John chapter 3 and the conflict that arises there. Let's take a look at that text in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 22 and reading through verse 30. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Enon near Salim because water was plentiful there. And people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between John, uh, some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, 
He who is with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given them from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase and I must decrease. Now, the first thing that we need to notice is that John's disciples are a little bit confused here about who the key actor is on the stage. And attention turns from John to Jesus as Jesus' ministry unfolds. The text finds John and his disciples baptizing at Enon near Salim. Now, we really don't know exactly where this is, but here's something we do know. We know that people were hungry for a change. People were looking for hope. They were looking for a restart, and both John and Jesus are making a dramatic impact in their ministries and in their preaching, and they're calling people to repentance, and they're calling people to the kingdom of God. Now, we know that John's been making an impact uh, even before Jesus comes on the scene. From the account of Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 5, we're told this, Then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. What we see happening is revival is breaking out, and John and his disciples, along with, uh, with, with some others, and, are right in the middle of it. John's message was a clear message that people were on the wrong path and, and they needed to make some changes. John was calling people to repentance. Uh, he was calling them to re-examine their lives and to, to take a turn for the better. He's challenging them to purify themselves in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Now, the baptism of John was specifically a baptism of repentance. It was a matter of turning and resetting. It's having a do-over. The practice of baptism, uh, being immersed in water and coming up out of the water is a picture of new birth, uh, a starting over. And John is making a massive impact even before Jesus comes on the scene. But then Jesus emerges and his presence expands. And as that happens, people begin to move towards Jesus and away from John. Unfortunately, John's disciples really didn't see what was going on. They didn't really get, have a pure picture, picture, clear picture of what was happening. What they see is that John's being upstaged by this newcomer. They begin to see the erosion of people following John and moving towards Jesus, and they bring it straight to John's attention. The text says there was an argument going on about purification between John's disciples and a Jew, Doubtless it had to do with the baptism that John was preaching and who had their theology straight. But the conversation quickly turns to questions of allegiance. John's disciples say, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and all are going out to him. Hey, what's up? We're losing our crowd. What's going on here? I think one of the greatest challenges that we face as humans is wanting to have center stage. In this moment, John's disciples see that they're losing the audience and they want to remedy that situation. This happens throughout the history of God's people and it happens with people in general. Once you gain power and notoriety, you don't want to lose it. It's really challenging. Who gets to be the key actor on the stage is the question we want to ask. And often we want to have that role. You know, it happens with Moses and Joshua in Numbers chapter 11. In verse 26 or 30, we, we come onto these two characters by the name of Eldad and Medad, and they're prophesying among the Israelites in the camp. And Joshua gets wind of it, and he's not having any of it. He goes to Moses and he says, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. My Lord Moses, stop them. And Moses' response to Joshua was priceless. He says, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. There's room for all of us on the stage, Moses says. You know, there are times when a leader suffers more from his zealous disciples 
than from his critics. Joshua is trying to protect Moses' position. John's disciples are trying to protect John's position. But we also see throughout scripture characters striving for themselves to get the center stage, success and, and the chief seats. Remember in Luke chapter nine, verse 46 through 50, that an argument arose among the disciples about who was the greatest. And Jesus reminds the disciples in, the king, in this kingdom economy, the least is the greatest. At one point, you may remember James and John literally asked Jesus to have the best seats next to him in his kingdom, one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus reminds them that in God's kingdom, things work differently. We see it in Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 44. You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, Jesus said, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be among you, would be first among you, must be slave of all. You know, one of the highest values in the kingdom of God is unity. It's what Jesus prays for as he's preparing to leave his disciples in John chapter 17. He doesn't particularly pray for their success. He prays for unity, which he sees as something that will bring their success in this endeavor. Jesus prays this, I don't ask for these ones you've given me alone, but for all who would believe that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Pick that up. So that the world may believe that you sent me. That, that was, the, that was the, what they were doing. They wanted to to have the world see that Jesus came as the Messiah. That was the project. You know, unity is threatened when everyone wants to have center stage. In this moment all around us, the unity of the church is greatly threatened by a number of, uh, for a number of reasons and on a number of fronts. We're in a crisis and there are lots of opinions about how we walk that out. We live in a celebrity Christian culture where we follow our favorite preachers and theologians and it's been the downfall of many popular Christian leaders, even in the last couple of years, to have that kind of power and influence. It can be tempting to take the spotlight when it's offered, because really, we probably all want to be the star of the show at some point. But when John's disciples come saying, hey, everyone is going over to Jesus, rather than becoming jealous, for more power and limelight, John points them back to Jesus and says, he's the star of the show and he needs to increase and I need to decrease. You see, John just keeps pointing to Jesus because Jesus is the star of the show. We should admire John the Baptist for multiple reasons, but not least of which is that he is clear that this whole enterprise is about Jesus and the new covenant he's bringing. All of the other actors on the stage, including himself, are there only to make Jesus shine. For John, it's always been about Jesus and always will be. John's very life bears witness to his understanding that it's always about lifting up Jesus and giving him preeminence. If we go back to Matthew chapter three, where all of Jerusalem and Judea and the people from all the regions around are going out to John to, uh, to, to be baptized, Jesus goes to John to be baptized. And the text tells us that John would have prevented Jesus saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? He understands the greatness of Jesus. And, and as John is preaching, he clearly states, one is coming after me who is mightier than me. In fact, I'm not worthy of the servant's role of taking off his sandals and washing his feet and carrying his sandals. And here in our text, John is clear. He says, I have told you all along that I'm not the Christ. I am only here to point you to him. John illustrates this with a picture of a wedding, a metaphor used often in scriptures. John says, I'm the friend of the bridegroom, not the bridegroom. Don't pay attention to me. I'm just the best man not the groom. The best man should never upstage the groom. It's just bad form because the wedding is not about the best man. The wedding is about the groom in this, in this metaphor. The job of the, 
of the, of, of the best man is to deliver the groom safely to the ceremony, to give a toast, talking about how amazing the groom is, and then to be filled with joy for the bride and the groom in their wedding celebration. That's the role of the best man. John says, I'm just the best man. I'm not the groom. And you know, each of us has a role in this kingdom endeavor, important roles, but we need to remember it's not about us. John points this out to his disciples in, in John chapter three, verse 27, when he says, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. He says, I'm just trying to do what I see God telling me to do. I'm walking by the light that I have. I'm fulfilling my role, which is not center stage. John's entire life, literally womb to tomb, is wrapped up in the joy of the coming Messiah. In the Christmas narrative of Luke chapter one, verses 41 through 44, Mary comes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John, and Mary is pregnant with Jesus. The text says that when Elizabeth heard the sound of Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth actually says these words to Mary, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Joy is the overarching emotion that accompanies the coming, the coming of Christ. It's the overarching emotion proclaimed in the prophecy of Isaiah chapter nine. Remember the text there, Verse one, there will be no more gloom for those who, are in, who were in anguish. The gloom is lifting because light is coming. The people in verse two who walked in darkness have seen a great light. It is a time of joyful celebration. The light has come. Verse three, the Messiah will multiply the joy of the nations like the joy of the harvest. Verse four, the yoke of burden, the bondage of oppression has been broken. God has stepped out of eternity and into time as wonderful counselor and prince of peace and its cause for great joy. Jesus is the star of the show because his coming is, is the point of the story of the new covenant. You know, the season of Advent is a season of being reminded that the Messiah has come and is, in, in his appearing, he brings a new and better covenant. And it's a cause for great joy. First, he is the fulfillment of the promise to Abram that God made nearly two millennia previously. We read about that promise in Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God asks Abram to trust him and makes him a promise that through him, all of the nations and all of the families of the earth would be blessed. That's good news. The season of Advent is the season of being reminded that the Messiah has come and he has ushered in a new covenant and a better covenant, the one promised through Jeremiah the prophet when the people were in exile in Babylon. We read about that new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, where God says through Jeremiah, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, the covenant, my covenant, which they broke, Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And now we know that Jesus is the fulfillment of that covenant promise because the writer of Hebrews restates it precisely in reference to Jesus in Hebrews chapter eight. He writes, but as it is, 
Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. The beauty of the new covenant is that it's not based on what we do, but rather in what God does. Notice as we look at the covenant stated in Hebrews chapter 8, Verse 9, the new covenant will not be like the one I made with them when I brought them out of Egypt, for they didn't continue in that covenant. They couldn't keep it because uh, it was based on law that, first of all, no one could keep perfectly. And secondly, it wasn't really something that would help them. The, the old covenant, the law, wasn't able to help them be better. It was only there to point out where they were falling short. Verse 10, I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. When God says, I will be their God and they will be my people, it's no longer predicated upon me doing the, all the right things in order to be proclaimed righteous. But now this new covenant, my righteousness is predicated upon the righteousness of Christ and the work that he's done. And that's good news. I will be merciful toward their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. It's good news. It's cause for joy. You know, the good news is that the old covenant has been fulfilled and that the new covenant now has come. The old covenant was a bilateral covenant and the new covenant is a unilateral covenant. The old covenant, a bilateral covenant, is based on human striving to keep the law in order to win the approval and be declared righteous. In a bilateral covenant, both parties contribute to an agreed upon position. The new covenant's different. It's a unilateral covenant, and it brings blessings that allow strivings to cease. It's like drawing up a will where the person making the agreement, the person making the will decides what's coming to those people to whom he or she wills them. And the person receiving only has to, well, receive. As I've been thinking through this text leading up to this message, Matthew Chapter 11, verses 28 through 30 has taken on a whole new texture and color for me when Jesus says, come to me, all who, are la who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My favorite all-time version of this text is the paraphrase, in the message that Eugene Peterson gives us, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. There is a great old hymn written by John Greenleaf Whittier in 1872 titled, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, in, in which he writes in the fourth and fifth stanzas, with that deep hush subduing all our words and works that drown, the tender whisper of thy call, as noiseless let thy blessing fall, as fell the manna down, drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. The blessing of this new covenant is like the blessing of the manna in the wilderness. Those who want it need only gather it up. It's freely given. And when the disciples of John come to John and say, why are all the people going to Jesus? John points right back to Jesus and says, he's the point. He's the main character. All the other actors on the stage are only here to make him look good. He's bringing the good news. John points back to Jesus as the main actor on the stage of this new covenant and says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, our role as actors in this play is to keep pointing to the star of the show, to the one who really has center stage. One of the questions that I have continually been asking myself over the past nine months or so is whether we, the church, and the disciples of Jesus have forgotten our primary role as followers of Jesus in the world. You know, we've pursued 
many priorities and agendas as Christ followers. As I think about it, particularly in America, that's my context. We follow famous people and we follow movements, but are we having an impact? Oz Guinness wrote, the scandal of the American church is while a higher percentage of people who live in America claim to be Christians than any other nations, the church has lost its influence. As you look on the church, the kingdom of God, particularly as it's living out the kingdom in America, because that's where we live, most of us listening to this video, do you have a sense that victory is coming, that we're having the desired impact? And if not, why not? And I suppose we could argue why not, there may be different reasons, but Jesus said this, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto myself. How do we lift up Christ in this really strange and challenging season? Church looks different, life looks a little different, but how can we lift up Christ in the midst of what we're walking through? How can we each, you and I, proclaim the good news and the great joy of Christ? St. Francis is, is attributed as having said, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. I want to challenge us in this season to let our lives speak. Let's make Christ preeminent by our actions and our outreach by proclaiming the gospel. There are lots of messages that the church is speaking into our culture today. It's the end of America. These are the last days. Persecution is cover, coming. The government is taking over. But when the angels came to the shepherds the night that Jesus was born in the midst of God's people being held under the boot of a pagan dictatorship and a ruthless regime, their message was, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And so the question I want to ask us is, how do we proclaim Christ in this season? We know that what makes God's, glad, what makes God's heart glad from Isaiah's prophecy, he says, repent and make yourselves clean. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Let your life speak of God's goodness in this, in this season. Seek justice and correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. And so perhaps the challenge to us today is that we examine ourselves, we repent. What do we need to let go of? What's taken priority in our life that has removed the focus from Christ who needs to have center stage? Are we using our influence and voice to point back to the main character in the story of history as a reason for peace and joy? Or are you using your voice to propagate fear and uncertainty? God says when we trust him, we can have confidence through the uncertainty. That's good news. Learn to do good, practice goodness, not as a matter of earning, but as a matter of proclaiming Christ. You know, in Matthew 25, Jesus tells us what matters to him as he talks about the prophecy of the final judgment. He says, come to me, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom I came to give freely because I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. As you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. Perhaps in this season, church looks different. Worship looks different. How can we embrace it? I wanna challenge each of us to ask that question. And maybe some steps to take in Jesus' name would be to find a family we can help. Maybe as a life group, we can reach out and take care of a family who is in need. Are there kids in your neighborhood that you can reach out to? Is there someone who simply needs encouragement in your life? Could you send them a card or a letter or make a phone call? How can you be Jesus to someone else in this, in this season? Could you have someone who's lonely and isolated to your home for a meal? How can you turn the energy of your family to serving? Proclaim Christ as a family, service project, take a meal. Bring some gifts. Go carol in front of someone's house. How can we bring joy of Jesus into the lives of the people around us this season? That's the call. Jesus gets center stage because he brings a new and better covenant. That's a reason for rejoicing. And so may God bless you as you serve and as you give and as you love in Jesus' name.